Today's speaker is Dr. Laura Struick. She is a postdoctoral fellow at the Propel Center for Population Health Impact. Laura has developed expertise in public health research, and her current areas of focus include e-health interventions, tobacco control, and gender-based research with a strong qualitative uh, research skill focus. And Laura is also involved in tool development for improved research practices. So with no further ado, welcome Dr. Stewart, and I uh, Okay, thank you, Emily. You. Um, just wanted to confirm that you can hear me okay first. I can hear you well. If there are any issues, okay. feel free to. Okay, that in the excellent. Chat. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to all of you who are here to join in on this webinar. And as uh, Emily had already stated, I am a recent PhD graduate from UBC's Okanagan campus. And I'm currently working as a postdoctoral fellow at the Propel Center um, of Population Health Impact at the University of Waterloo. Um, and so, for those of you who may be wondering, I am um, actually still in British Columbia. So, this is a remote position, um, which is a unique scenario to be in. Um, so, while I'm sitting here in my pajamas having coffee, you guys are probably all having lunch. Um, but no, I'm not actually wearing pajamas, don't worry. <laughs> um, and as you can see, the uh, title of my of my uh, of this presentation is the Secret Lives of the Super Graduates. So I'm not sure if any of you have seen um, the show called The Secret Lives of the Super Rich. But when I was presented this opportunity to present um, this webinar, I I I and combined with the um, fact that postdocs are also known as super graduates, this title just came to mind. Um, and also. Often we wonder what goes on in the lives of a, of a postdoc, and so I'm hoping that this presentation um, will sort of shed some light uh, behind what a postdoc is all about. And so I was very excited at this opportunity to share my experience as a postdoctoral fellow. Um, I remember when I was doing my PhD studies, my supervisor was recommending that I keep my eyes open for postdoctoral fellowships after I graduate, and I was wondering what it was all about, if it was necessary, and why I should apply for one. Um, so I'm hoping that the timing of this presentation is helpful for you in answering some of the similar questions that I had about postdoctoral fellowships while I was in graduate school. Um, and maybe by the end of this it won't be so secret. Um, so just a, a brief uh, outline for today's discussion. Um, I just wanted to begin with uh, some polls just to get to know you a little bit. Um, and then we will talk about me a lot. Um, we'll, I'll talk about my position and uh, some areas of research that I'm working on and then talk about how I got here and where I'm going um, and then discuss a little bit more about what types of postdocs are out there, some benefits and drawbacks to doing a postdoc um, as well as some tips for success in a postdoctoral position. Um, and then we will conclude and, and open the floor to some questions. Um, so, just to begin, I wanted to know a little bit about where you guys were at in terms of um, education. If uh, most of you are in graduate school or undergraduate school, if there's a little mix um, in that. Okay. Awesome. This is fast. Okay, so a majority of you are um, in graduate school uh, with, with quite a few doing, uh, doing your PhD, so that's great great to hear. Um, so this, I think, you'll, be, you'll find very helpful. Um, as well as for those that are in their undergrad, it's, it's great because there's a lot of um, stuff that unfolds um, to gear up for um, graduate school, if you're considering graduate school, uh, and, and then ultimately uh, for a postdoc if that's a potential road you want to take. Um, and so then I had another question, um, and this is just for fun, um, and that's if you could be doing anything right now, what would it be? I think I'm thinking about vacations these days. Okay, so it looks like zero percent of you. Um, <laughs> it, so um, I was hoping 
that most of you would say none of these because I wanted to know if how what the interest is going to be while I'm presenting. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I totally uh, uh, agree with all of that. I probably um, would love to be doing <laughs> uh, any of those at this point in time, especially sitting on a beach. Um, so just uh, to continue forward, I um, will talk a little bit about myself and where I'm at. So this is me. I am the specific title of my postdoctoral fellowship is a scientist, um, a population health scientist. And in this position at Propel, the focus is essentially on, on bringing the big picture together in terms of of linking evidence to action. So a population health approach encompasses the entire spectrum of health system interventions from prevention and promotion to health protection, diagnosis, um, treatment and care. And it integrates and balances action between them. So just a light, narrow field to cover. Um, but really the best part of my job is the innovation and cutting edge movements that can and are happening at a population health level, um, such as the use of social media and smartphones, um, for population health interventions, there's a lot par partnering with um, agencies on a global scale. Um, so the broad scope of this field really lends to some pretty exciting projects and experiences, which I will get to more in depth um, as we move forward. Um, so this is where I'm at, the University of Waterloo. Um, it the Propel Center is hosted by uh, the Faculty of Health and Applied Sciences at the University of Waterloo, um, and it is a Senate-approved center, um, and it's also a national program of the Canadian Cancer Society. Um, so this, this center essentially exists to prevent cancers and other chronic illnesses and, um, and to look into their behavioral and environmental causes. And there's more information on the uh, U Waterloo website if you wanted to look at this at this uh, population health center more in depth. My position at Propel started officially in September 2017, so I'm still pretty green in my academic career. Um, so some of the, I'll give you a little snapshot of the research projects that I'm currently involved in at the moment. Um, so Propel, one of the um, projects is related to Movember. Propel was commissioned to be the evaluation team for Movember's Social Innovators Change Project. So this includes 13 projects across Canada, the UK, and Australia. And the aim of these projects is to enhance men's social connections, which ultimately enhances their and their families' health and well-being. So um, as Propel's job, um, with this team is to lead the evaluation component for all of these projects, so both quantitative and qualitative. And I was, or I am, leading the qualitative evaluation component for this uh, for this for this project. Um, we also work with the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, and we've been employed to conduct some environmental scans to inform future research and policies in relation to cancer care. Uh, the most recent report that I led was a scan of how the public has been engaged to share their, um, to harness their views on health data collection, access, use, and linkage. It's a big thing right now with um, electronic medical records, and um, there's a lot of push to link electronic health re records, for example, with cancer care registries in order to enhance. Um, care approaches for patients, as well as to enhance efficiency of the healthcare system. Um, and so, the purpose of this was to understand what are what do the public think about this, what are their concerns, and what are their expectations. So that was a really neat project um, that I was involved in. We um, also work with uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada. Our most recent big project is uh, scoping research priorities for the next three years for the Population Health and Chronic Disease Prevention Branch. Um, and these priorities, so we need to identify three, scope out three priorities, and these priorities will then be presented and uh, interrogated at workshops that will be held over the next year. Um, some other scholarly activities that I'm involved in, um, I work with the CSTAD survey, so that's the uh, um, Canadian uh, Substance Use and Tobacco, Substance Use and Tobacco Use Adolescent Survey. Uh, it used to be called the Y. ISS, the Youth Surveillance Survey, I believe is, uh, I think that was the name of it, and um, and so I'm conducting some 
some secondary analyses on the survey data with a focus on cannabis use. Um, and then also uh, Crush the Crave, which is a quit smoking app for young adults, um, working on some evaluation and um, manuscript write-ups in relation to this in relation to this intervention. Um, my dissertation work was actually um, a qualitative evaluation of this app. Uh, okay, and so how did I get here? Working on all these things. Well, I can take you right back to the beginning. Um, I graduated with my bachelor's in nursing at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario. Um, I took a community nursing course um, that included a community practicum component. So um, I was working for this agency. It's called the uh, Best Start um, Early Learning Hubs. And so these uh, these hubs were geared at preparing kids for grade one. So they would offer um, programs that would help kids with simple, um, basic uh, skills that they would need in order to um, put them ahead at grade one. Something as simple as pattern matching or like even unzipping their backpack, for example. Um, things that they don't do at home um, and prepare them for school. And so this um, program, this practicum, had um, led me to see some gaps in terms of who was able to access these hubs and who wasn't. Um, and because of the disparate geographical uh, outlay of Sudbury, there were quite a few families that were actually slipping through the cracks and probably some very key families that needed this, these types of programs for their kids. And so um, I really wanted to get together and figure out how we can um, enhance the access of these hubs to, to parents. And so um, working with some of the people that were involved in these programs, we put together a, a volunteer driving program um, in order to address this need. So in this practicum essentially brought forward a lot of my interest in research um, in terms of needs assessment and then in terms of um, developing interventions to address the needs of the community. Um, and so when I graduated from nursing, I had my interest had been piqued in terms of the research already. I did work as a registered nurse in the cardiovascular intensive care unit at Sudbury in Sudbury for just under a year. And then I moved to Kelowna and I, I started my master's in science in nursing. Um, and so this started in uh, 2009. And I was under the supervision of Dr. Joan Batora. Um, this uh, seat, it was a, it, the master's in nursing was course based with a major paper or thesis option. I opted for the thesis option. And I, um, again, conducted a qualitative study on uh, use of Facebook to deliver tobacco control messages towards girls. Um, so I was drawing on the expertise of, of my supervisor, which is in uh, health promotion and uh, specifically tobacco control and um, employing a gender-based lens to my research, um, which I think I do in everything I do now. Um, and then I also worked with Dr. Batorek as a research assistant for uh, a few years um, while I was doing my master's. Um, and while I was doing my master's, I also obtained a psychosocial oncology research training fellowship. And I had a very, so Dr. Batorf, she's a, um, I was very blessed to have such a um, supportive supervisor. Um, and she really helped prepare me for, um, not just from, for my master's, but helped prepare me for what I was going to do after. Um, it seemed like she was always thinking ahead, like if I were to pursue a, a PhD or um, a career, how to best prepare me for that. And so applying for fellowships was one of the main things um, that, that she promoted. And I, I was very lucky in terms of um, the, on the fellowship front. And this brings me to another question that I have for you. I just want to know how many of you have applied for or received a, a fellowship for, the, for your research.
Okay, so it's it's an even even it's a fifty fifty split, um, and so that's that's good. I can sort of speak to, um, and I'm sure some of you can relate to the benefits of of applying for and, and obtaining a fellowship. Um, and so during my masters, uh, as I did this fellowship, and because I had this fellowship, a lot of networking had occurred. Uh, opportunities for presenting and publishing um, um, were occurring just even at that master's level which really helped prepare me and as I entered into uh, PhD. Um, I worked for um, the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention, so Dr. Batorf is the director for that, um, for that institute, and I worked with her for um, a year on research and knowledge translation activities, um, focused mostly on um, tobacco reduction, interventions focused on, on tobacco reduction. Um, so then uh, I did. I started my doctor in philosophy in uh, interdisciplinary studies. So it was focused on nursing, but uh, interdisciplinary studies was uh, is the title of my PhD. I again continued under the supervision of Dr. Batora, and uh, pre-candidacy period I continued to um, maintain my psychosocial oncology research training fellowship. Um, I then also acquired a uh, picked it. Fellowship that was actually out of the Propel Center for Population Health Impact, who I am currently working for. Um, and I also worked as a research assistant at the Propel Center for Population Health Impact. I was very interested in, in work uh, in relation to Crush the Craze, so that smart, smartphone app for uh, quitting smoking. And I worked alongside the lead scientist in terms of putting together um, other uh, research projects around around that, so other evaluative components around that uh, intervention. So again, lots of networking, presenting, and publishing, and a lot of this was occurring because of and through um, the fellowships that I had acquired. Um, so I took <laughs> a leave, and I had this um, beautiful gift. Uh, this is my daughter. I was about a year and a half into my PhD before I took um, before I took a leave, and um, she's she's now four. And as you can see from the picture, she loves to ski. So out of all of those questions that I posed to you earlier, I'm sure she would have selected skiing on a mountain. Um, um, she wouldn't be sitting here listening to me, that's for sure. So um, one thing I wanted to say, though, was that even though I took a nine-month maternity leave, one of the best things I did was staying active on a scholarly level. So while I couldn't work on my PhD, I could still work on projects with colleagues. Um, for example, continuing to work with um, the lead scientist of Crush the Crave. Um, I was even able to lead a qualitative research project and was able to present and publish um, before the end of my leave. And for me, I felt like this was key in terms of keeping my head in the game. I'm not saying like you have to keep working um, or anything like that, but for me personally, I felt like it just helped me stay on top of um, the on top of um, the, the career. Uh, scholarly side of things, um, which was very helpful for me in terms of transitioning back into my program of uh, my PhD program after maternity leave. Um, and so then, post candidacy candidacy period, I again continued to maintain a picked up fellowship. I continue to work at Propel, I continue to network and present and publish, and then my dissertation, as I had said before, um, was a qualitative evaluation of Crush the Crave, and um, it is currently uh, being reviewed for publication in the Journal of Medical Internet Research, so keep your eyes open um, if, if you're interested in reading that. So what do I do? <clears throat> This is a little snapshot of exactly what I do and, and what the outputs look like. Um, so I do a lot of teamwork, a lot of presentations, and a lot of publications. Um, and if I could stress one thing, it's probably teamwork. There's a lot of um, transparency and communication and positive energy um, that really makes my job extremely enjoyable. Um, and in my position, given that it's remote, I really have to ensure that my colleagues know that I'm there and that I'm there to work with and support them. Um, I have even adjusted my work time to um, Eastern time, so I get up 
and start working um, as if I were in Ontario. So this is why you can know for sure I'm actually not in my pajamas right now. <laughs> um, and so uh, being able to work alongside them, so to speak, um, has been very important just in terms of building that, building that um, teamwork, working relationship with, um, with those in, in this remote, remote position. Um, I also wanted to note that um, most of, while most of my work is assigned work, um, I also have the opportunity to pursue some independent work. Um, so I can work on publishing my dissertation research um, as well as pursue personal interests. For, so, for example, conducting a second, the secondary analyses on the CSTAD survey data is um, really something that I'm, I wanted to pursue out of my own interest and is supported by and facilitated um, through Propel. So it's a nice balance between independent like be, I, it's not like I feel like I can't pursue my own interests. In fact, I'm very supported in that regard. So it's not like a postdoc. You are are uh, in the position where you're just being told what to do all the time. There is a, there is some free reign in there. Okay. Um, so where am I going? Um, well, I am fortunate to have had the opportunity to extend my fellowship into 2019. And I've also been offered a uh, scientific position once this contract is up. So I, I actually feel in some ways that this has come too easy for me. I, I have a dream job. I'm able to work it remotely. So it really facilitates my lifestyle given that I have my daughter. Um, and they also want to keep me on board. So I, I'm very blessed to say the least to be working um, at this Propel. At Propel. Um, and so given that uh, Propel is uh, a national and international leader in evaluation. A couple of my colleagues are what you call a credential evaluator. And so this is something that I would likely want to pursue um, given my strengths and interest in, in, in evaluation. Um, so a credential evaluator is essentially a, a designation provided by the Canadian Evaluation Society. And um, it's a professional association program, um, or it's a profession, professional association for program evaluation in Canada and aims to contribute to the professionalization of evaluation practice. Um, so this designation is designed to support the professionalization efforts by uh, defining, recognizing, and promoting the practice of, of ethical evaluation in Canada. The program can take up to 30 months to complete. So it's a rigorous process, but it gives you an edge in terms of employability, um, maintaining your employment, as well as representing an evaluation heavy institution such as Propel. Um, and also really good for um, publications. I, when you have a publication with uh, CE, uh, with someone who has a CE, um, it gives a lot of reassurance that the way that the study has been conducted is ha that it has been conducted in an ethical manner. So um, lots of benefits to acquiring this. It's just it, it, it is quite tedious um, to complete. That is probably where where I'm heading. Um, so just a little bit um, about pursuing a postdoc for those of you who, who might be interested. Um, there are lots of different types of postdocs out there. There's both academic and non-academic. I'm really only familiar with the academic side of things, but some non-academic streams could be something like um, biotech, science policy, or um, science communication. Um, I remember I used to think of a postdoc as a one-year stint, and that's it, but I've learned that this position can extend beyond a year, such as in my case, and that uh, people often do multiple postdocs depending on their career goals. Uh, some fields require it, um, such as the sciences, while others don't, um, like social sciences, humanities. Um, for those who would want to pursue a tenure track, a uh, postdoc contributes to the scholarly activities that are required for a tenure track, so it's not like your tenure track um, goal is being hampered at all. Um, it's really like you're being supervised for the first year or two of your tenure track, 
which is, um, there's a lot of benefits to having that. Um, and so I just wanted to speak to some of those, some of the benefits of pursuing a postdoc. Um, I always think of, of a postdoc as you're doing what you would normally do uh, after you graduate, but you're doing it with training wheels, you're doing it with a lot of support. Um, and so the, the, the key benefits of, of a postdoc from my perspective is that you get to refine and expand your areas of interest and expertise. When I first graduated, I thought of my expertise and, and uh, my career pursuits in a very narrow way. I thought of myself as a tobacco control researcher, um, whereas as soon as I entered Propel, this whole um, world opened up and I was thinking, okay, no, 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 like I, the, I, I need to look at this more in a more of a, in a big picture way. So I have, I have developing expertise in evaluation, which could be applied not only in tobacco control, but in a variety of other um, areas and fields. And so it really has opened up my scope um, and um, has supported me in, in, in pursuing things that I didn't even um, really identify with. For example, um, uh, the development of evaluation tools. I have, I have worked on a, on a few with Propel as well as before I started with Propel um, developing tools um, to facilitate um, equitable evaluation. And um, this is something that has really br been brought forward in, and, and people have been, um, in, at Propel, have been um, drawing upon for their work. So it's sort of some things that I thought were just side projects or, are actually coming forward and, and I'm helping inform the work of others that I work with. And then people that I'm working with are obviously really um, feeding into and helping me develop my skills and expertise in a variety of ways. So um, it's been very good that way. Networking and mentorship um, has been um, unbelievable. You, you get to meet uh, a variety of stakeholders in your field of interest or in your fields of interest um, and, and you can connect with them. A postdoc is essentially a bridge between education and career. It, you can think about it like a residency position in medical school. You're, you're not completely independent, but you're essentially 80 to 90 percent independent, but with major support, like I said before. Um, and then also having a postdoc can um, make you more employable um, because you are, uh, you are developing experience under the direction of a well-known research center. And so it's actually beneficial for applying for a tenure track, tenure track profession, professorship, um, if that is of interest. Um, and then finally, you get to contribute to the advancement of science, which is um, which is it, probably the most exciting part of of being in this position. Um, there are a few drawbacks, but you got to take them with a grain of salt. Um, I think, you know, the long hours and the tendency to take your work home that is often associated with a postdoc position or any other academic position, it's, it's really almost impossible to not take your work home. I've taken my work or my school home ever since I started graduate school, and I think that's okay um, because I found that actually some of the best ideas have come forward when I'm in a relaxed state or I'm just relaxing at home. So I think it really all depends on how you work. Um, I also really like what I do. I often will get up early or stay up late to work on a project, um, but I enjoy doing it. So I'm not looking at the hours groaning about what's going, how many how much time I'm putting in in a day. Um, so there's a few factors that feed into into that postdoc experience and whether it's um, and and how um, how you feel about the long hours. Um, Propel, uh, postdocs are not known for their large salaries. Um, Propel does take care of me, but generally a small salary is the norm. I uh, think that the starting salary is around 50000 a year. Um, and another, um, I guess, criticism of postdocs is that you still feel like you're in graduate, graduate school. But again, it depends. Um, I'm given a lot of freedom by my employer. So 
I don't feel like I'm a minion or like I can't pursue my own interests, like I said before. So a postdoc is variable and it's important to pay attention to your interests and goals and your work ethic and, and how that combines with an organization and, and with your employer. Um, so um, on that note, I have a few tips on terms of what to look for in an employer. Um, when you are interviewing for a postdoc, it's it's a two-way street, and that's one thing that I loved about um, Dr. Barb Riley. She is is um, my supervisor and employer at Propel. Um, and right out, right at the outset, it was like this is this has to be a mutually beneficial position. Um, and so it was a bi-directional type of interview where it was it was like, do you do we have what you need, and do you have what we need in order to work together and really really advance science together in the way that we both envision? And so um, that respect um, for the knowledge and skills that I have that I have acquired during my graduate school was very apparent and, and I can see it's very important now that I'm immersed in this position. Um, and like I said, that mutual benefit is also a key thing to pay attention to. Um, open line of communication. One thing that Barb and I always do every single week is we check in with each other every half hour. I mean every half hour. Every, once a week for half an hour. <laughs> and um, just to whether we, we can talk about, it doesn't always have to be about work, it could be um, even about personal things, just to check in and, and keep that, um, that work environment really positive and, um, and supportive. Um, so that, that open line of communication has been really key to having um, such a great experience in this role. Um, transparency and, and clarity about organizational goals and changes is also key um, to look for in an employer. Um, just so that you know where where you fit in in the big picture, and, and that's another thing that Barb ensures while I'm uh, while I'm there. Um, and she does that for everybody. Um, I also have some personal tips for success, um, and that's the, the really quite 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 simple, um, but also I think very important. To make sure you're authentic. Just be be yourself, um, be humble, um, be friendly. Remember that you, even though you may not end up working with the institution that you're doing the postdoc at, you will likely end up working with these colleagues for the rest of your your career because you are in, you are all in 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 a field that probably if you're not in the same field, a cross cutting field. Um, and so, just remember to <laughs> um, to contribute to that positive um, work environment. Um, be accountable and communicate a lot. Um, like I said, being in a remote position has really emphasized the need to be uh, accountable and, and to communicate a lot. Um, but I think that would go in any position regardless of whether it's remote or not. And finally, be kind to yourself and let yourself rest and celebrate projects when you've completed them. And I think that's very important. And, um, and, and my employer also um, will say, you know what, take the weekend and just like celebrate um, the, that you that this project's been finalized and so that's okay it's good to validate yourself I don't think we do it enough um, and so uh, <laughs> just uh, this is one of my final slides here I hope I'm okay for time um, should I do a PhD I know mo um, are, quite a few of you are already doing a PhD um, this is just a funny funny pie chart about motivation to do a PhD and how, how you might want to think about it, whether it, uh, uh, <laughs> um, whether you love studying, uh, you're unable to find a job, um, whether it keeps uh, your interest in a subject, or whether you just get to call yourself doctor, and uh, which is pretty cool. <laughs> um, but really, some things to consider are, um, what are your goals? A PhD is very demanding, but it's rewarding. Um, you need to think about all these things that you need to balance um, in relation to other aspects of your life. Uh, you got their relationships, there's children, there's other personal pursuits and goals um, that, that need to come in there and there needs to be a good balance. Financial situation is something to consider as well. Uh, potential supervisors, you want to find one that has your back. Um, I've been very, I, it seems like ever since I started my undergrad, I've been very lucky in terms of having supervisors and mentors that have had my back. I've heard many stories about night, 
nightmares, and I have had the best experience, so I'm very lucky. Um, and then also consider fellowships as a must during graduate education because they have been key to um, um, helping me be active in terms of uh, presentations, uh, helping me network with those of similar interests and, um, um, and, and with manuscript publications as well, uh, getting, some, getting some lead author and co-authorships um, down. And then also, um, it, like if I didn't do, if I didn't pursue a uh, picked it fellowship with Propel, I probably wouldn't have um, found or be in this position as a postdoctoral fellow. So I really think a lot of doors open with uh, a postdoc with it with a fellowship. So uh, research fellowship. So I highly recommend um, looking for that. And if your supervisor hasn't been hasn't recommended or um, uh, put that forward to you, maybe something to talk about with your supervisor um, and, and and think about pursuing something like that because there's lots out there um, and they're and they're very beneficial. Um, so that marks the end of this presentation and I'll conclude with a big thank you um, for being a receptive audience and again to Hi, Emily uh, and PAJ for inviting so we me have to received speak to two this questions, webinar series. One from Catherine um, and Chelsea. I'll now open um, up the floor to Just because any it's very tied to you what you have. just ta uh, talked about, I'll go with uh, Chelsea's questions first. So um, she's wondering, could you elaborate more on how to look for suitable fellowships and, um, and when? And also, what type of opportunities typically come with a fellowship? If you have examples, that'd be great. Go just okay, um, yeah. and yeah. so when you talk about fellowships, I'm assuming at. that you're talking about research fellowships during your graduate education, is that correct? Okay, yes, okay, so um, a lot, uh, your su supervisors are generally in the know in terms of what types of fellowships are out there. Um, generally, they, they uh, fall in line with um, your area of research interest. So, for example, um, I, when I was working with, with Dr. Batora for my master's, my area was in tobacco control and um, and um, so you might want to look at fellowships in relation to so the so the the sorry the psychosocial oncology research training fellowship was in relation to cancer cancer care and cancer prevention and so tobacco control is a natural fit um, with that type of fellowship um, and so uh, Joan um, worked was on the board for these um, programs and so she was able to um, be um, I guess pushing giving me um, the or she's even a mentor often supervisors are mentors for these programs so for PICDIP as well as report um, she was, was an assigned mentor for those that were taking the fellowship so someone that um, graduate students could go to um, and so often supervisors are involved in these mentorship programs and so it would be good to go seek advice from your supervisor. I don't think that um, it's an expectation that you go and um, look for this type of stuff on your own. It's often a conversation I would recommend with your supervisor because they can help you step back and look at how your line of research might fit in with fellowships that you might not think fit with what you're doing. Um, so, you know, like I said, I often thought of myself just strictly in tobacco control, but you got to take a step back and think, okay, it has applications to cancer and then it has, which has applications to population health. And um, so it's definitely a recommendation um, to look for that through uh, initiating conversations with your supervisor or your, even your supervisory committee members. Um, when to look for a opportunity I would I would say you could look for an opportunity uh, pretty quick like right 
I got my um, fellowship within the first year of my master's program. I still didn't even know what my research topic was going to be when I got my fellowship. And the fellowship actually helped me shape what my research topic was going to be. So um, as soon as possible, in terms of applying for a fellowship, you don't have to have um, everything Yeah, so we set have a question stone, from say, Catherine. So she's you're, asking if you have any tips on bal balancing having a small um, child with a postdoc work, question. especially when um, you're often taking your work home. Any other questions? Yes. Um, compartmentalize. <laughs> I, I find that I am not a good multitasker, which is probably a good thing um, um, for my daughter because I find that when I'm doing something, I have to focus on that one thing. Um, and so uh, balancing, it's always going to be a challenge. I, am, I admit that I... Um, I often feel guilty. Sometimes I feel like nobody's getting the best of me. I sometimes feel like my daughter's not getting the best and my job's not getting the best. Um, um, but really, it's just uh, probably the, a key thing is to just relax and not be too hard on yourself. Um, and then also taking your work home. I mean, when you're with your daughter just or with your child, just be be with your child. I mean, that's, that's probably the most important thing. Thing um, from the perspective of, of, a, of a mother, and uh, you'll prioritize that. I I I have uh, so my daughter and I we it's just me and her, so it's, it is quite quite a bit of a balance. Um, but she's in a lot of programs, so she's in preschool, so that helps. Um, and then she's also in other programs throughout the week. Um, but on the weekends, I try and make it just about me and her. And if I have to, I will get up early or um, stay up late and do some work. But it's it's totally doable. Thanks for that. But the but the most the highest Thanks recommendation I have our third is question. when you're with your child, this one is from your child and put work aside. And I apologize um, because I and, don't and just know be, the be okay with um, She's also like an INTD doctoral student, so. Yeah. Wondering if you found it difficult to categorize or identify yes. your work, and if so, how did you navigate around this? Interdisciplinary. Thanks, Marcy. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah, so... I, um, my, okay, so I, I, as, as you, as I said before, I graduated from uh, UBC's Okanagan campus. Their PhD nursing program was not um, running full throttle. And so I needed to navigate that by entering into an interdisciplinary stream. Um, so an interdisciplinary stream enabled me to basically tailor my courses, my coursework, to my research interests. So I have a heavy interest in um, population health um, and e-health, and um, I was able to bring in uh, committee members that were not just in nursing. So I had an, a person in education with a lot of experience in e-health. I had someone in public health. Um, and then, and then two individuals in nursing. So, um, I, I found that having that um, interdisciplinary focus really came through in um, the different perspectives of committee members that I've had on my team, um, and helped enrich um, the way I was looking at my my dissertation research. Um, and so, yeah, I I. I, I went into my research kind of knowing what it was that I was going to do, uh, and so I think that helps you define your uh, what your program of research is going to look like because you do have to detail which courses you are going to do um, and and who's going to su to support all the substantive um, and methodological areas of your research. Actually, one thing that I did that was really helpful to justify um, and support this interdisciplinary approach was I made a wheel, identified the 
five substantive areas of my research and the main methodological approach. And then from that, I, I drew like arrows of courses that were going to support each of those each of those areas and then arrows of each of the committee members who were going to be who had expertise in each of those areas and could support those substantive areas. So um, 